I greet you, saints, in the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It truly is an honor again that we gather again to come and share the word of God together. But before we share the word, can we please pray? Heavenly Father, we come before your holy throne of grace in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father, for your love. We thank you, Jehovah, for your goodness. We thank you, Father, for your mercy that endures forever. There is no other God besides you. And Lord, I thank you for this time again. Thank you that you have put your word in my heart, O oh God. Thank you, Father, that you're giving me utterance, Redeemer, to fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. I pray, Almighty God, for everyone who's going to listen to the word right now, that Holy Spirit will open our eyes to see what the Father is saying. I pray for understanding, and I pray, Lord, for the conviction of the Holy Spirit, that whoever hears the word, Redeemer, will respond to your word. I thank you that your word is alive, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing the joints and the marrow. Your word, O oh God, brings clarity. Your word brings counsel. Your, bread, your word brings light, Mudimwaka, even the darkest areas of our lives. We give you honor, Father, and we give you glory in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, thank you for this opportunity again to come and share the word of God with you. As I said, it truly is an honor. The word of God is a treasure that God has given to men. It's wealth. The Bible says that the word of God is medicine to our flesh. It is marrow to our bones. So when we take time to Reflect on what the word of God is saying. Embrace the truth and live by it. We are nourished in our spirits and our souls are anchored and our body is healed. But beyond that, it, the word of God has the power to shape our lives and to help us model what true faith is. And today it is in my heart to share with you that we have an inheritance in Christ. We were celebrating the Passover the past few weeks and we were focusing on the death of Jesus Christ. We're focusing on the fact that Christ died for us. And he came and before he died for us, he came and lived on earth and modeled how a believer must live. And having done that, he gave his life for us. He was crucified. He hung on the cross for us so that we may be reconciled back to God. Now, beyond that, we have to look back at the way to say, what has the death of Jesus Christ brought us? What has it done for us? Now, I want us to look at what the word of God says, and I've titled my sermon, We Have an Inheritance in Christ. And the first scripture I want us to have a look at is in the book of Hebrews chapter 9, verse 16. The Bible says, in the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the, the death of the one who made it. Because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It will never take effect while the one who made it is still living. I'm going to read the scripture again. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it. Because the will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. And so now when we look at this scripture, this scripture tells us that the death of Christ put into effect the will of God in our lives. Had Christ not died, the will of God would have remained unknown to men. The will of God would have remained a mystery to men and would have lived on planet Earth without really knowing what God has in store for us. And because of the fallen state of men, God had to send Christ to come and die for us so that men can have access to God. Without we should not be, we would not have been able to have access to God had Christ not died. Now the word of God says that a will only comes into effect when the one who wrote it has died, once the, there's proof that um, the person who's left you an, an, an inheritance has passed away, then the beneficiary now has the right to claim the inheritance that the person who wrote the will has left. Now the word of God says that Christ did that for us. He died. And when he died for us, the will of God became effective. It, it came into effect. It was, it was, it was something we could access. It was something we could claim. It was something that we can partake of. And this all happens because Christ died. And so when we look at this, it shows us that it is important for us to know that the, 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 the significance and the importance of Christ in our lives can never be overemphasized. Outside him, we still remain without having access to the benefit and the inheritance that God has in store for us. But when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we then become partakers 
of everything that God has in store for us. So Christ remains the only way that God has put forth for men to be reconciled back to him. And beyond reconciliation, that man may, man will be able to then now partake of the inheritance that God has in store. Now the word of God says that um, the will of God becomes effective in our lives. Now you may ask me, what is the will of God? The will of God is the word of God. And the word of God says that God delights in our well-being. So if we don't have Christ in our lives, the will of God remains veiled. It remains covered. It remains unknown. We are unable to understand what God has in store for us because it is through Christ that that light comes into our lives. You will remember in the past few weeks I spoke about the fact that the word of God says that in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God and he came and dwelt amongst men. And so everything begins and ends with Christ, so to put it. And now the word of God says that he came and he died for us. And when he died for us, then we then began to understand the will of God for men. And when you understand the will of God for men, then it means because the will, the will of God it, actually, it is correct because they call it a testament, which is what legally they would refer to if they, they were reading um, a, a will of someone that has passed on to be, to, to be with the Lord. Now, in our case, this book is the testament that contains the plan of God for our lives. This book has got an old and a new testament that contains the will of God for our lives. And when we stay away from this book, we will remain ignorant of the inheritance that God has made available to us. Now, the word of God is the will of God. And the will of God is a way that God has chosen to communicate, unfold, and declare his heart to mankind and to everyone who has accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. So what am I saying? I am saying without the word, it becomes impossible for us to partake of the inheritance that God speaks about. Let's take a scenario of where the will must be read of someone who has passed on. All the beneficiaries are called and the lawyer that has been appointed to administer the will will then, will then address the people that are there. Firstly, you make sure that everybody that is a beneficiary is there and once that, has, one that, once that is done, then the, the will be, will be read out to say, this is what so-and-so is going to get, this is what so-and-so is going to get. And it's the same thing that we see in the Word. We'll see as we continue studying that the Word of God is exactly that. God, Christ died, and because he has died, he left us this inheritance. And for us to discover that the, the, the inheritance that God has given us, it is found in the Word of God. And that is the Word of God. That is why I'm saying the Word of God is the will of God. And now, what is the will of God? The will of God is that we be well. God delights in the well-being of his children. God delights in us discovering the love he has for us. God delights in us discovering the path he has set forth for us to live in. God delights in us discovering how true he is and how committed he is to what he said in his word. And all those things are found where? They're found in the word. And when we become uh, acquainted with the word, we stay and we study the word. We then discover the will of God. Let's read Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 41, so that I can qualify what I've just said to you when I said that God's, God's will is that we be well. Jeremiah 32, verse 41. The word of God says, I will rejoice in doing them good and will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart and soul. Now, I've just said that the will of God is the word of God and the will of God for us as his children and the will of God and the word of God for everyone who hears it, believes it and embraces it is that we be well, well spiritually, well emotionally and well physically. So God delights in our well-being as his people. And so the word of God says that God says, I will rejoice in doing them good and will assuredly plant them, plant them in this land and with all 
I will rejoice in doing them good and assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart and soul. So there's this there's, there's commitment that God is saying, when you come to me and you embrace my way, I am committed to making sure that you are well. Now, the other thing that I want us to see, it's another thing to, to say, you know, to know that there's a will. And I've already said that Christ died and he died so that the will of God can be effective in our lives. But then what does that say about us? What does the word of God say? You know, because we need to we need to qualify what we're talking about so that it doesn't sound like we're just being superficial or just making statements so you are not able to substantiate, substantiate them biblically to say what the word of God says concerning the inheritance that God has for us in Christ Jesus. Now, when we read Colossians chapter 1 from verse 9, it says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a, a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Now Paul speaks to the believers in Colossae, in Colossae and he, 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 he mentions or clear, clarifies what his desire is or what his prayer is for this church. And he says the first thing that he prays for is that it is his prayer that God will fill the, the, the believers. I, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So what does it mean? It means in the absence of the knowledge of what the will of God is concerning our lives, we are unable to live a life that shapes our life. We are unable to live a life that shapes our character. We are unable to live a life that shapes our, our conduct. We are unable to live a life that shapes how we speak, how we carry ourselves. All those things are found in us knowing the will of God for our lives. And Paul says, he prays for that. He says, I pray that God will fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And when we find that, we find that in the word. When we go to the word with the help of the Holy Spirit, we discover the will of God for our lives. That's what the word of God says. And then the word of God says, when we know the will of God, we are able to live a life worthy of the Lord and we're able to please him. So when we find that we're struggling in a certain area in our lives, we then need to check, do we know what the will of God says concerning that matter in our lives? It may be sickness. It may be lack. It may be a bad relationship. It may be circumstances that you don't even know how to explain how you find yourself there. But how do you come out? It's not sitting there and crying and complaining about them or telling the world about them. But it is going back to the word of God and saying, what does the word of God say concerning this matter? And it is the prayer that Paul has for the believers that they may know the will of God through all spiritual wisdom and understanding beyond knowing the ability to apply the knowledge that God gives forth when you read the word of God so that you are able to do what? To live a life that is worthy. A life that is worthy of our calling, a life that God expects us to live, is not attainable, is not possible in the absence of the knowledge of the will of God. So the will of God is very key for us to be able to live the way God wants us to live. Yes. Not only does he want us to do that, he says when we know the will of God and we live a life worthy, then we are able to bear fruit in every good work growing in the knowledge of God. So there is no way we can, we can walk and model the will of God in our lives and not bear good fruit. So good fruit is not an automatic attribute. It's something that comes as a result of you as a believer embracing the will of God, living by it, living a life that is worthy of the calling that you understand to be your calling according to the will of God. And therefore, with the lifestyle you live comes a fruit that is good. That's what the word of God is saying. Another thing that the will of God does when we study the word of God, the Bible says, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that we may have great endurance and patience. So then another thing that we see when we read the word of God, when we study the word, we realize that then we are able to be strengthened. So strength comes through studying the word of God, which is the will of God for our lives. So then I have already said that God wants us to be, he, he, he means well for us. He wants us to be well. So it means when we endure, we have the, the, the courage to endure, the courage to be patient and wait. Those are, that, that, that's, that's an attribute or a character that is displayed by someone who has confidence in God. And God wants to see us being able to be people of endurance, not people who quit, not people who run out of patience, not people who, who start wondering, is God going to come through? What's going to happen to us? But God, as we study his word and understand his word with the revelation that the Holy Spirit gives us, then it births in us the ability to be patient. 
and we are able to be people of endurance. And people of endurance don't shy away from challenges. People of endurance don't shy away from difficult times. People of endurance are able to stick it out. Why? Because the word of God in them becomes the anchor that tells them tomorrow is coming and tomorrow is going to be brighter and tomorrow is going to be different. But in the meantime, while we're waiting for the sun to rise again, we need to be a people that are able to endure and a people who are patient, knowing that God will never fail us. All these attributes, all the good things that we see in other people, that we perceive as strong, especially those that believe God, they are people who have found the truth of the word of God. Then it all happens when we study the word of God, when through by the spirit of God, wisdom and, and, and understanding is imparted into our lives. And as we live a life worthy of that knowledge, we become people of character and we're able to enjoy and we become patient. And when we are patient, we cease from complaining. When we are patient, we are full of hope, even in our speech. When we are patient, we, we, we stay away from anything that we want to steal the strength we find from God. So every time we are tempted to complain, every time we are tempted to speak like people without hope, we remember it is the word of God in us that anchors our soul, that helps us to be able to stand. But the one thing that I love more than anything about the scripture is verse 12. It says, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. I've already said that I'm speaking about the inheritance we have in Christ. It, it, it just humbles me to know, just when I accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, God qualified me to be a partaker of the inheritance together with God's holy people in the kingdom of light. So it's not something that I had to work for. I didn't have to do anything. I just had to believe that God raised, uh, uh, that Jesus is Lord and that God raised Christ from the dead. And when I did that, the Bible says that then I, I, I was qualified. I was translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. But amongst other things that happened, a miracle happened when I believed in Christ. One of the miracles that happened is that I became a partaker of the inheritance in the kingdom of light. So when I become a partaker, it means there is a portion that is due to me. There is a portion that is allotted for me. There is a portion that awaits me, that awaits you as you listen to me. If you have not given your life to Christ, that at the point of accepting Christ as Lord and Savior, you become a partaker of the inheritance that God has given us. We've already mentioned in the word that the will comes into effect when the one who wrote it has died. So that Christ died for us. And because Christ died for us, then the will came into effect which is what the word of God. And what is the word of God? The word of God is an inheritance that God has for us. And the Bible says, I was qualified. I didn't have to work. I didn't have to go to school. Yes, education is good. But the one thing that we find with faith is that when we believe, we become partakers of the good things that God has in store for everyone who believes. Now the word of God says that we are qualified to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. You know, this blesses me so much because the Bible says that we qualify to share. You know, under normal circumstances, when a will is read, somebody may be sitting there and feel aggrieved maybe that according to them, the portion that was allotted them is not the same as the portion allotted to their, to their brother or their sister or the cousin or whoever may be benefiting from the, from the will that is read. But here the word of God says that I qualify for a share in the inheritance. And the share that I qualify for cannot be, I cannot, nobody can contest it. Nobody can say to me, no, God has given you too much and he has given me little. God has allotted to each and every one of us a portion of this inheritance. And it's up to me and you to believe that. And when we believe that there's a portion that God has set aside for me, then I make it my responsibility to draw closer to God and say, Father, what is your will for my life? It is in me discovering the will of God for my life, embracing that, that the truth of everything that God has allotted for me begins to be real. It begins to impact the way I think before we can even talk about the material blessing. I love the fact that when we embrace this truth, it changes the way we carry ourselves. It speaks to the way we speak. 
It speaks to the way we think. It speaks to the way how I, inter- how, how, how I fellowship with my brother and my sister. It speaks to what I value. It speaks to what I esteem as important, as less important. So the one thing that I love about faith in Christ, before anything else, it helps me be who God desires me to be in conduct, in the way I speak, in all that. And as a result, all the other material blessings that come, they are a product of the fact that I've discovered this truth about who God says I am, that I qualify for this inheritance. So the word of God says that I qualify for an inheritance. And the word of God says that this is in the kingdom of light. It is not in the kingdom of darkness. There's no under underhanded ways of doing things. There are no tricks to me acquiring this inheritance. I don't have to bribe anybody to be a partaker. I don't have to beg anybody to be a partaker. I don't have to worship anybody to partake of this inheritance. When I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior, I became a partaker. I became a partaker of the insights of the mysteries of God. I became a partaker of the wisdom of God. I became a partaker of the knowledge of God. I became a partaker in the glory of God. I became a partaker in the power that is in the blood of Jesus. I became a partaker in calling the name of Jesus and experiencing the authority that it carries. I became a partaker in walking around without any fear now that I am in him and he's in God. So I'm completely safe. I become partaker, a partaker of this inheritance that assures me of the love of God continually so. Whether I sleep at night or I'm about in my home or wherever I could be, I never doubt the assuring hand of God that I'm a partaker of the inheritance of God in the kingdom of light. I want us to read Psalm 16. Psalm 16 says, verse 5, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my Lord secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful heritage. So the other thing that we see when we look at the word of God is that the word of God says that the Lord is my portion and my cup. And the next thing that the word of God says about this inheritance, it says, he has made my Lord secure. Everything that God has for you is secure. No one will have access to it. No one will steal it from you and then you end up not benefiting from it. When you believe what the word of God says, God says, your lot is secure. It is secure. So when something is it's secure, what does it mean? It means it's safe. It means it's protected. It's out of the reach of the enemy to want to try and steal it or whatever. The Bible says that your lot is secure. That which God has allotted for you as his child is secure. So God wants you to approach him, not even worrying about who has got what, knowing everything that I need in this life. The Bible says that God has given me everything that I need that pertains to life and godliness. So everything I will ever need in this last in this lifetime is in the Lord that God has, has, has allotted for me. And the word of God says it is secure. When that need arises in my life, and I remember I have an inheritance in Christ Jesus. I approach the Father and say, Father, according to your word, I have this inheritance. Let's take one example that I, that I were to be sick. If I fall sick, that's not the time for me to be worrying that maybe somebody is bewitching me. Maybe this and that and that and that is happening in my life. I need to remember there is an inheritance that is set aside for me. And in that inheritance, divine health is my portion. And the word of God says that portion is secure. And so what I do, I go to the Father and I say, Father, according to your word, my inheritance includes healing. It includes divine health. And right now, in the name of Jesus, I claim the health portion that has been allotted to me to be effective in my body. And as I release my faith, as I claim that, then I begin to realize and live in the reality of divine health in Christ Jesus. So it is secure. Nobody can can, can tell me I cannot get it. Even if I don't have money to go to the doctor, I'm not saying don't go to the doctor, but you find yourself in a situation where you're unable to go to the doctor. It is just not far from you. It's within your reach. At the point of discovering what the word of God says, and you go to the Father in prayer and say, Father, according to your word, health 
is my inheritance. I claim it now in the name of Jesus. And you see God coming through for you. It may be like in your life. God is so near to the needy. So, so near to the needy. You may wake up in the morning and realize there's no food in the house for the children. There's an inheritance of supply for you as a child of God. The word of God says, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. And you can sit there and say, Father, I have an inheritance in Christ Jesus. And the Bible says I qualify for it. And because I qualify for it, I claim your supply according to your riches and glory through Christ Jesus. And you see God doing it. Maybe you may be asking me, how is God going to do it? I don't know how God does it. It remains a mystery how God is able to touch somebody in another place to give to you. My, my worry is not that is not how God is going to do it. My worry is do I believe that God is able to do it? If I believe that God is able to do it, then I wait in faith knowing that God has promised. Then God is able to touch whoever needs to give me whatever that I need and that person is able to give it to me. And that, that whole process that happens behind the scenes that we don't, we don't see will remain a mystery. All we have to do as children of God is that God expects us to continue to believe. But the truth of the matter is that you have an inheritance, a lot that is secure, that awaits you to come into the presence of God and begin to claim of the inheritance that God says is yours. It is available. Nobody can steal it from you. The word of God has already qualified that it is a lot that is secure. The second thing that I love about this inheritance, the Bible says that it is a delightful heritage. I've already cited that um, sometimes when a will is read, when people leave a room where a will was read, you, you may find that people leave that place with mixed emotions. Some are unhappy, some are ecstatic. Some feel like they didn't get as much as they expected. So sometimes in, in things that men give us, there could be strife, there could be jealousy, there could be animosity. There could be so many things that come as a result of maybe in our eyes we feel so and so deserve better or not. But the one thing that I love with the heritage that God gives us, the Bible says it is a delightful one. As I, as I walk with God, embracing everything that he has for me, there is such a delight in my spirit. There is such a joy that God brings in my life. When I look at the things that God gives me over time, as I look around, I know, no blood was shed for me to have them. No man's blood, so to put it. The only blood that qualified for me to have that was the blood of Jesus. But what I'm saying is, I did not have to kill anybody for me to acquire what I have. I work where I work and I get paid the salary that I get paid. It is all because of the grace of God. It is a delightful heritage. When I look at my children and I see how healthy they are, and I know that I didn't have to take them to the doctor sometimes for them to be walking in that health, it is a delightful heritage. When I look at my house, the Bible says that you will walk into your house, you'll look around, you'll check your stock, you'll find nothing missing. When I walk into my home and I find that my home is exactly as I left it, nothing stolen, nothing broken, and I can look and say it is a delightful heritage because God has promised to assign his angels to encamp around me. When I wake up in the morning after having slept for several hours and I wake up and I'm as healthy as I was when I slept at night, I look with delight and say, look what the Lord is doing. He has assigned his angels to encamp around me. I do not have to worry that someone will break into my house when I'm asleep. Why? It is a delight heritage. It is a heritage of protection. It is a heritage of provision. It is a heritage, a heritage of peace. There are so many things we get when we accept Christ. And, and I'm just citing a few that are coming to my spirit now as I minister to you for you to know it is a delightful heritage no man has got to fight with you for what God gives you I wrote here each and every one of us has what belongs to us and I wrote what belongs to me that which God has for me is for me and nobody can do anything about it. It is mine. In God's sovereignty, in his wisdom, he allotted me this. In his will as my father, he believed that portion was enough for me. Now, I don't spend time worrying about whether other people think it's too much. I don't spend time worrying whether people think she has too much more than I do. No, 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 no. You can always have as much 
as God says that you can have only if you believe and you understand God has allotted to you it is enough to last you a lifetime it is a delightful heritage it doesn't bring strife I don't have to envy my brother to have what they have I have what's mine I have to discover it in the word of God I have to believe the word of God embrace who God says I am and I live in the abundance of what God has for me I don't have to kill my neighbor to have my, what my neighbor has I have a portion that God has allotted for me it is secure it is delightful I'll sleep at night knowing everything I have did not cost anybody their lives I did not to have to maneuver my way to be where I am I didn't have to steal I didn't have to kill I didn't have to do to hurt anybody to be where I am I embraced the death of Christ and that was enough to give me access to everything that God has. And the Bible says it is a delightful heritage. You will live. That's why the word of God says that we will live and we'll see this heritage continuing from generation to another, one generation to another. And we'll look back and be in awe of what God has done. Why? Because it is delightful. It never takes anything from anybody. It is just when we walk in the fear of the Lord, embracing his truth for our lives, that we begin to, to experience what God speaks about. And that's why it's a beautiful heritage. It, it, it goes um, generationally as well. If the Lord tarries, my third and fourth generation will walk in this delightful heritage. If they follow the God that I follow, if they serve the God that I serve, and they will remain in peace. Why? Because they will be living within what God has given them. So it is a path that when we believe and embrace, we will never be without. It is a delightful heritage. What I love about it, God is committed to it. When we read the book of Joshua, chapter 21, as I close, the word of God says, Joshua chapter 21, verse 43 to 45, to verse 45. So the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sown to give their ancestors, and they took possession of it and settled there. The Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sown to their ancestors. Not one of their enemies withstood them, the Lord gave all their enemies into their hands. Not one of all the Lord's good, good promise to Israel failed. Everyone was fulfilled. This is the God that we serve. The first thing he does, God promised them that God spoke to Abraham, our father in the faith. And he said, your generation will be as many as the stars. And the word of God, when you look, you see how God was committed to to the, to the covenant he entered into with Abraham. And later, even in the life of Israel, we see them realizing that the father they are following in the faith had faith in God. And now the word of God says that, verse 43 says, the Lord said that, so the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sown to, the, to their ancestors, and they took possession on it and settled there. God made a promise to Abraham concerning the Israelites. Way after, long after, Abraham had departed, God still honors that promise, the promise he made to their ancestors. God is committed. That's how far committed God is for you to be a partaker of the inheritance that he has for you. Even things he promised your forefathers that maybe have departed without having seen you step into them. God does not forget what he promised your father who was in the faith, who left believing God for your breakthrough, for your miracle. Maybe your mother used to pray for you or your father used to pray for you and they've gone to be with the Lord and you look around and you wonder what's going to become of me. God is still committed to every prayer your mother and your father offered on your behalf and, and God is committed to see that come to pass. All that God expects you to do, walk in the path that your mother and your father walked in so that you may become a partaker of what your, fa your father and your mother pray prayed for. When you read the book of Hebrews, it says that some prayed and believed and they departed without seeing what they promised. But they believed that the one who promised was faithful. So yes, maybe you find yourself in looking and saying, but my ancestors, maybe in your bloodline somebody believed the Lord for you, that you will be born again. And now that you are born again, you look back, it looks like your future is bleak. Your future is not bleak. Your future is not blurry. Your future is very bright. Step and walk in the inheritance that God has. We see a word here saying God allotted a land to the Israelites that he had promised their ancestors. So it, it, it simply means even prayers that are offered by those that loved God, that left before you, and you never maybe even got to know, you still have access to that inheritance. You've got to believe the word of God. The second thing the word of God says, God gave them rest. I said it is a delightful heritage. 
it brings rest. The pleasure of resting and not worrying. The pleasure of resting and not afraid. The pleasure of rest that God gives to those who live in his heritage. The Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sown to their ancestors. Oh my God. God promised their ancestors that he'll give them rest. Their ancestors are not there anymore, but God still honors his word. He still gives them rest as he saw to their ancestors. He did not only give them land, but he gave them rest to qualify that this heritage I'm talking about, it is a delightful one. And the word of God says then, not one of all the Lord's good promise to Israel failed. One, every one of them was fulfilled. There is not one single thing that God has promised you that is going to fail if you believe. Keep the faith and believe. Everything that God promised you will come to pass. God is that faithful. The last scripture I want to read for you, I want us to have a look at, is the book of Ezekiel chapter 12. Chapter 12. The faithfulness of God for us to partake of this inheritance we have in Christ Jesus. Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 28, it says, Therefore, say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, None of my words will be delayed any longer. Whatever I say will be fulfilled, declares the Sovereign Lord. God says in his word, None of my words that I said to you will be delayed anymore, any longer. Maybe you're listening to me and you're like, I've waited so long. Will this ever come to pass? Today I'm here to declare to you, according to the word of God in Exodus chapter 12, verse 28, 28. God is making is reminding you and making a commitment. You will not wait till any longer. There will not be any delay anymore. If there's been a delay in your life anymore, God says the delay is over. He says the wait is over. The delay will not, will not go on for a longer time. The time for delay in your life has ended. God says he will not delay in coming through for you. And he says whatever I said will be fulfilled, declares the sovereign Lord. So God is making a promise to you. Everything that he has promised you, he will bring it to pass. Keep believing. Keep believing. Watch the profession of your mouth. Keep saying the things that God said about you. Even at the point where you are tempted to say, it looks like it will not happen. Keep believing what the word of God says, because God is not a liar. Yes. Everything he promised in his word, he is going to do. But the one thing that God wants you to know is that God is saying in his word, um, he, will never, he will never fail you. He will never. He will never fail you. He will never let you down. Yes. Maybe the waiting is long. He has, say, he has said today to us, the waiting is over. Maybe you feel frustrated. You feel like things are not happening. I mean well. I do well. But I don't see that happening. God says it shall be fulfilled. Keep the faith. Believe. Keep the faith. Believe. It is a war of words. Watch what you say with your mouth. Even in the face of adversity, of difficult times, say what God promised you. God said in his word that by his wounds I have been healed. That is what I'm continuing to I'm going to continue to confess. The word of God says that my God will supply all my needs according to Jesus' glory. That's what I'm going to confess because God is on, committed to honoring his word. There's a scripture that comes to mind now. I it has been in my spirit for such a long time. And I I I every time I look at it, I, I wonder. I know that I said we're closing, but I, I just want to read the scripture for you. When you read the book of Mark, chapter eleven, I want to show you what Jesus says and how important it is for, 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 for us to, to hold on to the profession of our faith. When we read the book of Mark 11, verse 12 says, The next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if, if, if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. 
And his disciples say, say heard, him, heard Christ say that. And then they go on with their business. When you read verse 19, the word of God says, When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cast has withered. Verse 22, Jesus says, Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. That's what Jesus is saying. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it. Not you will receive it, that you have it already. And then the word of God says, it will be yours. That's why I was saying, that which God has for you, nobody can take it away from you. So the truth is, we are delaying ourselves most of the time from partaking of the things that God said they are ours. Why? Because of the things that we say after we have prayed. It means our confession becomes important. Jesus spoke to the tree, walked away from it. He did not expect to come back and find that tree having not withered. But the word of God says when he comes back, he finds that the tree has withered. The, the, the disciples, one of the disciples remembers that Jesus cast this tree and truly it has withered. So what Christ is teaching us is that what you say and you believe is what you will get. You will not get what other people say and, and believe about you. It is what you say about yourself in line with the word of God, that which you believe, and that's what's going to come to pass. So if you believe in your life that God has got a good plan for your life, and you say that about your life, that is what is going to unfold in your life. That is what Jesus says to them, have faith in God. And he goes beyond that to say, when you believe, when you pray, believe you have it. So what does it mean? It means when you walk, you walk like one who believes. You speak like one who believes. You carry yourself like one who believes. You are expectant. You don't let your expectation fall flat. And you end up wondering, is God going to come through? No, your expectation is something that you need to monitor. And, 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 and what's the word? And feed all the time. So that your expectation stays there to say, I know God said it. And I know God is going to do it. Now we have an inheritance in Christ. But the big question is, do you believe? And if you believe and you embrace the truth about yourself, the word of God says, you will have it already. You're not going to have it. It's done already. God has already made a promise that he will not delay any longer. Your answer has come. Watch what you say. God, what you say. Be careful of the, the, the words you hear around you and choose not to agree with anything that is contrary to the promise you are waiting to see manifest. If you believe in God for a miracle, this is not the time to be around people who think miracles are things of the past. You need to stand and say, God is still a miracle worker. He's still a way maker. And I'm going to continue to believe that. And when you hear anything contrary, you walk away from anything that speaks contrary to what you are believing God for. What are you doing? You are guiding what you are hearing because you know if you hear wrong things for a long time, before you know it, you are going to say them. And what are they going to do? They are going to work against the word of faith that have already sown in what you believe in God for. So Jesus makes it very easy and very simple. Say it. Believe it. And it shall be yours. And it doesn't depend on anybody. This is what I love. Nobody can stop you from partaking in the inheritance that God has for you. The most important thing is, hold on to what God says about you. Believe it. Walk in it. Speak it. They may call you crazy. They may call you maybe somebody whose mind is not working properly. But you know, all things are possible, the Bible says, to them that believe. So I will hold on to the profession of my faith, knowing that Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for me, to see to it that everything you promised about my life comes to pass. So beloved, father, mother, my sister, my brother, the little ones, we have an inheritance in Christ. It doesn't please God when you go without. The truth is, his will carries in it the truth about the inheritance that he has for us. As we go into the word and study the word, begin to believe everything that God says about our word. Speak it. Hold on to what we have said. We shall become partakers of this inheritance. Not in the life to come, in this life. David says, I will not die. I will live and I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. There is a portion allotted you that you must take part in on this earth. Yes, we are going to heaven. Yes, there's a portion that's allotted for us for heaven. But I'm talking about living a life that is full of the promises of God being manifested in your life in the land of the living. It is possible.
May God bless you as you continue to meditate on this word. May everything you desire manifest. Everything you've always desired, everything that you've always wanted to see God do in your life, it is my prayer that it comes to pass. And may it not delay so that you will not think that God has forgotten. May it come as swiftly as God has said. One thing that I have learned, God is committed to meeting my desire that he has put in my heart. So quit worrying about what other people are saying about you or how ill they think of you or how ill they plan for your life. It will not prosper. It will not come to pass. The word of God says there is no weapon that is formed against you that shall prosper. The one thing that shall prosper is the word of God concerning your life. Believe it. Say it. Watch over what you say. And everything that God has promised you will manifest in the physical. You will touch it. You will taste it. You will show it to people. It shall be something that you can show people that this God has done. Because the God I'm talking about is faithful. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your aid. You are good, you are merciful, and you are kind. There is no other God besides you, Mudimaka, and I thank you, Father. Thank you for your word. Thank you that the word of God is medicine to our flesh. It is marrow to our bones. Thank you for the word we have received today. That, Father, as we look at your word and we believe your word, and we hold on to your word of oh God, everything you desire for us is done in Jesus' name. And while we're still praying, if you're listening to me and you've never given your life to Christ, I want you to follow me in this prayer. Just say this prayer after me. Say, Father God, I believe that Jesus is Lord. I believe that you raised him from the dead. And your word says, when I believe that, I am saved. Jesus, I accept you into my life. Come into my life. Be Lord and Savior of my life. I thank you, Father, for salvation. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Thank you, Father. We give you honor, Lord, for every soul that's going to be saved when they hear this word, my Father. Thank you for restoring and refreshing us as your children. We bless your holy name that it is done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.